Kabani Savage, born January 1st, 1975, was raised in the Richard Island Projects in North Philly, which was one of the toughest housing projects in the city, before moving to the Hunting Park section. He attended Frankfurt High School, but he wouldn't make it past the ninth grade. He ended up dropping out. He was heavily influenced by his father, Joe, who was already knee deep in the drug business by the time Kabani was born and his father's business partner, Bubby Thomas. By the time Kabani dropped out of ninth grade, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Bubby Thomas eventually took him in as his new partner. During this time, Savage took up the gym and had shown promise as a young boxer. He got his start working at the Front Street Gym in North Philly and later attended a boxer camp run by promoter Don King. His mother told the Philadelphia Daily News in 2004, Kabani Savage, a junior welterweight whose best punch was a quick left jab, was 15 and 0 as an amateur. He was smooth and quick, said his sister and fellow convicted murderer Kadada Savage, who briefly turned pro in 1997. Records indicate that Savage won his only pro fight. He began his career in illegal drug trafficking around the same time in the early to mid 90s by being a block runner. Savage found that he had a knack for the hustle and was outselling his counterparts and quickly made a name for himself. Before long, he was peddling PCP by himself, selling mostly out of his mother's house on Darien Street. Before long, he was a distributor of PCP in various forms, as well as marijuana, crack, and coke. He had connections with numerous dealers who controlled drug corners in the vicinity of Erie Avenue in North Philadelphia. For a time, he was in partnership with the Erie Ave mob. By the late 1990s, Savage had come into his own. He was in control of four or five blocks, dealing in multiple kilos of coke at a time. As his sales increased, Savage began to dilute the drug and then recompress it to increase the quantity. His profit margin rose accordingly. In the early 2000s, one of Savage's main players was Eugene Twin Coleman. Coleman helped distribute to various individuals in the group and also handled proceeds from drug sales. Savage's inner circle included enforcers who carried out Savage's commands without hesitation. Among the enforcers were Kareem Bluntley and Lamont Papi Lewis. Although loyal to Savage for a time, Coleman and Lewis eventually cooperated with the government prior to their respective guilty pleas in February 2004 and April 2011. Both testified at Savage's 2013 trial about the operations of the KSO and its use of violence, and that violence was often deadly. The Kabani Savage saga would quickly spiral out of control. Four federal indictments ended up coming out this story along with city officials getting caught up as well. I'll be here for hours trying to break down everything that went down in these cases. So many names, faces, and characters are involved and I literally don't have enough time to go through and explain it all. We would be here for hours, so a lot of names and elements of this tale are gonna be left out for time's sake. I think I got the most important and relevant info possible, however. What turned Kabani Savage's tale from a drug kingpin to one of the most notorious names in Philadelphia history started with a single incident that happened in March 1998. Tobias Flowers was another big name in North Philly in the 90s. Along with 8th and Pike and 9th and Pike, Flowers' main corner was the notorious 8th and Butler. Aiden Butler is notorious even among notorious drug locations and it has been for a long time. There had been north of three dozen murders in the vicinity of Ethan Butler in just five years. Almost all young men from their teens into their early 20s killed within a block of Ethan Butler. It is a very tough corner. In March of 1998, when Savage was in the vicinity of Tobias's drug corner on Ethan Butler, a man by the name of Kenneth Lassiter a barber from Lansdowne in town to visit a friend accidentally bumped into Savage's car. A confrontation ensued 
and Savage demanded that Lassiter pay for the damage. Despite Lassiter's apology, Savage allegedly said something to the effect of, does anyone know this guy? To a couple of people, including Flowers, who was out there on that fateful March afternoon. When no one said yes, Savage pulled a gun out and shot him once. Lassiter died from the gunshot wound. Flowers witnessed the murder. Flowers and Savage had somewhat of an uneasy alliance and were kind of respected enemies. They sold in the same area, but they managed to keep it cordial until this incident shattered that illusion. By committing murder on Flowers' corner, authorities argued that Savage was able to shut down Flowers' drug dealing. A murder brought police, and a police presence made drug dealing impossible. Eventually, Flowers got his business back up and running, but he never forgot, and that may have been one of the reasons he agreed to testify for the DA's office against Savage, who was indicted for the Lassiter murder. Both men were from North Philadelphia. Both had been professional boxers. Flowers' decision to cooperate, while in theory a violation of the code of the street, was viewed by many as an act of revenge for what Savage had done on his corner. Flowers declined the DA's office offer for protection. He stayed on the streets, and on March 1st, 2004, on that same 8th and Butler corner, he was shot 17 times. The shooting occurred just two days before Savage was to go on trial for murder. This started a pattern of witnesses and potential witnesses who worked directly for Savage disappearing. This is what the state says happened. Mansur Abdullah belonged to the Savage family, and he and Savage would supply each other with coke, according to court records. It was Savage who first taught Abdullah how to dilute and recompress it, which eventually raised the suspicion in Savage's mind that Abdullah was overcharging him years down the line. In September 2000, Abdullah visited Savage to collect a debt. Savage paid him with cash placed in a red sneaker box. He then told Kareem bluntly, to go with Abdullah back to his crib under the disguise to provide protection because of robberies that had recently taken place. Bluntly was strapped. Coleman was told to pick up Bluntly soon afterwards. When Coleman and Bluntly returned a half hour later, Bluntly handed Savage the red sneaker box back with the cash still inside. Although Bluntly had carried out the instruction to shoot Abdullah, he was unsure if Abdullah was actually dead. Savage instructed Coleman to find out Coleman followed orders and later confirmed that he saw Abdullah slumped over in his car. The car was later set on fire with Abdullah inside. Carlton Brown was another victim of multiple gunshot wounds to the head and chest. Although Brown was a member of the Savage family, Savage suspected Brown of killing Savage's good friend Ronald Walston. Savage instructed Lewis that he had to do it, which Lewis understood to mean he had to kill Brown. Lewis obeyed and Brown was killed. Lewis also murked Barry Parker on Savage's orders. It appeared Parker was attempting to take over Stephen Northington's drug corner, so Northington complained to Savage, his supplier. Savage replied to Northington that nobody come and take nothing. You have to handle your business. This is what we do. On February 26, 2003, at Savage's command, Lewis left Savage's house with Norvington. They saw Parker on the drug corner. Lewis then shot Parker several times in the chest, effectively eliminating Norvington's competition. Two days after the Parker murder, Kapani Savage was sentenced in a state court on a cocaine possession charge. He had pled guilty and got 18 months of probation. He had yet to face a jury for the murder of Kenneth Lassiter the broad daylight killing at 8th and Butler. 